Tonight, our special coverage as Israeli survivors from Hamas's attack file a lawsuit against the Israeli government. Assalamu alaikum and good evening. This is Muslim News Canada on Muslim Network TV. I'm Aisha Ashraf. Today is the 88th day since Israel started its indiscriminate war on Palestine. Despite global calls for a ceasefire, Israel continues to target civilians, their homes, and civilian infrastructure. Palestinian Authority Prime Minister Mohammed Shetaya says people in Gaza are facing exposure to epidemics and diseases due to a lack of food and poor hygiene. Multiple media sources report intensified Israeli bombardment in central and southern Gaza with ground operations expanding. Palestinian Red Crescent Society says Israeli soldiers are raiding Palestinian homes in Nur Shams and Tulkaram refugee camps in the West Bank. An ongoing Israeli raid in Nur Shams has lasted for 16 hours. Numerous arrests have been made with homes and infrastructure being damaged severely. Many Palestinians have been severely beaten by Israeli soldiers. This marks Israel's 11th raid on the camp since it started its war three months ago, resulting in the death of 27 Palestinians. The Qassam brigades of Hamas group have targeted Israeli military vehicles and detonated improvised explosive devices in the Gaza Strip. The Committee to Protect Journalists has released the names of 87 Palestinian journalists killed by Israeli attacks since the onset of war. At the time of writing, the Palestinian death toll stands at 22,313. 57,296 are injured. More than 8,000 Palestinians are buried under rubble. Israel's revised death toll is at 1,139. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is set to visit Turkey to discuss the crisis in the Middle East. Houthis have targeted a container ship headed towards Israel. In a rare move, the Biden administration has criticized Israeli officials for calling to reduce Gaza's population. However, Palestinian rights advocates argue that the administration's objections do not hold any weight as it continues to provide support to Israel. The Israeli government has not claimed responsibility for the drone strike that killed Hamas senior official Saleh al-Aruri and six others in southern Beirut, Lebanon. The area is described as a Hezbollah stronghold. The victims also included other Hamas leaders, including Samir Afendi and Azam al aqra However, Israel's military has declared a state of high readiness following the assassination. In response to the assassinations, Hezbollah says it has launched nine attacks targeting Israeli positions across the Lebanese border. A disturbing report by the United Nations International Children's Emergency Fund shows that more than a thousand children have suffered amputations of one or more limbs in Gaza. Many of these surgeries have been performed without anesthesia due to a severe lack of medical resources in the region. The blockade imposed by Israel forces healthcare workers to operate in unhygienic conditions without providing pain relief to patients. Palestinian Children's Relief Fund founder Steve Sosby says the number of child amputees is likely to grow. He says many of these children are at risk of bone infection if medical treatment is delayed. Dr. Hassan Abu Sitta, a London-based surgeon who traveled to Gaza to treat patients, says most of his patients are children who need amputations. He says in a single night at Al-Ahli Hospital, he performed amputations on six children. UNICEF spokesperson James Elder is calling Israel's war as, quote, 10 weeks of hell for Gaza's children who cannot escape the devastating impact of the conflict. Survivors of the Hamas attack in Israel are filing a $56 million civil suit against Israeli security forces. The music festival incident on October 7th led to 1,139 casualties. 240 Israelis were taken captive in Gaza. 42 plaintiffs argue that Israeli negligence contributed to the tragedy. They claim that senior Israeli officials had expressed concerns about the event's security, but failed to act. The lawsuit states that a single phone call to disperse the gathering could have saved lives. The plaintiffs seek compensation for lost earnings, pain, suffering, and medical expenses. Additionally, the suit points out that inadequate security was provided during the festival. Only 27 police officers were present to protect the event. A New York Times report reveals that Israeli officials possessed Hamas's attack plan over a year before, but did not take it seriously. 
Ontario's Ministry of the Attorney General is making law students from Toronto Metropolitan University with current or future employment opportunities to fill out a mandatory form. The form confirms if the student signed an open letter criticizing Israel's war on Palestine. The ministry's form warned students of job offer revocation or dismissal if they provide false information. The open letter was released by the university's students on October 20th. The letter has been signed by more than 70 students. It condemns Israel and Hamas's actions. It also calls Israel an apartheid state. The ministry's policy is seen as punitive by experts. Critics argue that the policy reinforces anti-Palestinian racism in the public sector and sets a dangerous precedent. They're calling the move as one of the most extreme actions taken in Canada against students who protest the Israeli bombardment and invasion of Gaza. A law professor at the university condemns this as a disregard for legal and constitutional rights. The ministry justifies its actions by claiming to combat discrimination, Islamophobia, and anti-Semitism. Across Canadian campuses, students and faculty expressing solidarity with Palestine are facing death threats, false accusations of supporting terrorism, and formal disciplinary actions by university administrations. In November, the Student Society of McGill University called for divestment from corporations complicit in settler colonial apartheid against Palestinians. In response, McGill served them with a notice threatening to cut their funding and block their use of the university's name and facilities. At York University in Toronto and the University of British Columbia, student unions face similar institutional pushback. A Muslim advocacy group has urged the government to eliminate the limit on the number of Palestinians allowed to seek refuge with their Canadian relatives. The program, set to launch soon, will grant visas to a maximum of 1,000 Palestinians if their families in Canada can support them financially for three years. The National Council of Canadian Muslims argues the cap fails to address the urgent need for help. The group says the cap will result in fierce competition for the limited visas, leaving many vulnerable individuals behind. The group is also calling for a ceasefire to end the violence in Gaza. Canada's new Democratic Party leader, Jagmeet Singh, has urged a need to address the increasing hate crimes amid Israel's aggression on Palestine. Singh says it is important for Canadians to create a space where they can express their fears, worries, and political opinions without facing hateful conduct. During the interview, he shared concerns expressed by Jewish and Muslim Canadians who fear for their safety due to the surge in hate-motivated violence. He says Muslim and Jew Canadians worry about wearing religious symbols that are integral to their identities. Singh drew parallels between the current situation and how he was targeted for his faith. Toronto Police reports a significant rise in hate crimes, including anti-Semitic and Islamophobic incidents. Similar incidents have been reported in Montreal and Calgary. Saudi Arabia State Television has confirmed today that the kingdom has officially become a member of the BRICS economic bloc. This move follows months of consideration by the Saudi officials. Originally comprising of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, the bloc is now set to double in size with Saudi Arabia's inclusion. The United Arab Emirates, Egypt, Iran, and Ethiopia are also joining the bloc. On the other hand, Argentina has declined joining the group. It has cited some divisions within the bloc as a reason for its decision. The kingdom's decision comes amidst rising geopolitical tensions between the U.S. and China and a growing Chinese presence in Saudi Arabia. Despite maintaining strong ties with the U.S., Saudi Arabia has been exploring its independent path. China, a crucial customer for Saudi oil, has advocated for BRICS expansion as a counterbalance to Western influence. Thank you for watching. Our news is produced by Muslim Network TV, which is a not for profit organization. We need your support for donations. Please scan the QR code on our broadcast or visit MuslimNetwork.tv to donate now so we can continue to amplify the voices of Muslims in Canada and abroad.